Welcome to Hope for the Caregiver here on American Family Radio. This is Peter Rosenberger. This is the program for you as a family caregiver. Family caregivers make up 65 million people in this country. 65 million. That's a fifth of the population. I know. I said there would be no math on this particular program. But if you love somebody, you're going to be a caregiver. If you live long enough, you're going to need one. If you are such a person, you're in the right place, and I'm glad to have you with us. Hopeforthecaregiver.com. Hopeforthecaregiver.com. I've been trying to do a kind of a quote for the day, and I wanted to give you one. This is from my book, A Minute for Caregivers, When Every Day Feels Like Monday. And I wrote this line, thought this might be meaningful to some of you all. As caregivers, we often must make decisions that benefit the whole unit, not just one person. We get in the trap as caregivers where we're thinking of someone almost to the exclusion of everyone else. And I understand why, because that person has extreme needs. But as a caregiver, you are meeting one of those extreme needs. And if you don't think about the person meeting the needs of the person in need, then you run the risk of compromising the entire ecosystem of that individual. So sometimes you got to make a decision for the whole unit. What's best for the unit? And sometimes we have to make those decisions unilaterally. So one person is tasked with making the decision for the whole unit. That doesn't sound like much fun, and I get that. It's not. But that's the job. If you feel that you are operating out of guilt or fear or any of those things, what kind of decisions are you going to make? See, that's the whole point of this program. I'm not here to give caregiving tips. We'll have them. I mean, you can't help but have them. We're going to talk about it. We'll swerve into all kinds of things, whether it's, you know, handicap accessible features or taking up the throw rugs or how to deal with an insurance company, how to deal with doctors. Yeah, we'll cover all that. I got that. Okay. But how many of us make good decisions when we are gripped with fear, when we're gripped with guilt, or we're gripped with obligation? And how long do you think you can make decisions if you feel obligated to do this? You feel trapped to do this. You feel like this is what you're supposed to do. How long before that turns into full-blown resentment? How many of you are already there that you're, you're struggling with this right now and you just feel resentful? And I, I took a temperature of our Facebook group the other day, just in one word, describe how you feel. And you see the, 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 the dynamics of what people are dealing with. They're afraid, they're worn out, they're mad, they're exhausted, they're depressed. It's all over the map. How many good decisions are made with those kinds of feelings? Well, I would suggest to you that not many. So what do we got to do? Well, we got to back away from the cliff. We got to get to a place where we are calming ourselves down. We're speaking to our own spirit to settle ourselves down. And then we have to have an anchor point that helps us make good decisions in spite of what we're feeling, in spite of sometimes what we're seeing with our very eyes. What I mean by that is many of us have to look at suffering and we cannot allow that suffering to dictate good decision-making. We have to think clearly. We have to detach from that somewhat. They're depending on us to do it. I mean, think about when, when you're in a situation, when you're hurting How many good decisions do you make when you've sprained your ankle or broken your leg or fallen and, you know, got yourself cut or whatever? You're you're kind of in almost in panic mode sometimes when you get to that level of trauma. How many good decisions are you making? Well, that's the same point that our loved ones have to deal with and they count on us to do it. But if we are so... Paralyzed is a good word, but it's not just paralyzed. If we're so encumbered by 
all these other things, whether it be fear, obligation, guilt, resentment, terror, any of those things, what are you going to do? Somebody has got to step back away from that and have a clear head. And if you don't do it as a caregiver for your loved one, who is in line behind you to do it? So that's our reality. Somebody has got to keep a cool head. Now, that's hard to do. And I would suggest to you that you can't do it on your own. You're going to need help to do this. And that's why this program is anchored in what the scriptures say. What, what does God say? Now, I promise you, I've looked. There is no place in scripture where I have found any type of clear instructions on how to deal as a husband caring for his wife for somebody with 86 surgeries, both legs amputated, and going on for 40 years. I've looked. It ain't in there. Okay? Not there. But there are a lot of scriptures that talk about fear, feeling weary, guilt, anxiety, sorrow, depression, loneliness. All of those things are covered. And if God has this in his scriptures, in his word to us. People always say, well, I, I, need, I, I, would, I need to know what God's will for my life is. He's already said it. And within the confines of his decreed word that we have, we are free to use the mind that he gave us. You know, some people overthink this. Well, what, is God, what kind of job does God want me to have? Well, what, what kind of job do you want? Does it line up with the values and the directives that he has in Scripture? I mean, do you think God is going to want you to be a drug dealer? No? Well, okay. Cross that off the list. <laughs> and I understand that's an absurd example, but sometimes you make your point with absurdity. We don't have to overthink this. And I'll, I'll never forget a dear pastor friend of ours, when Gracie and I were looking at a decision to have a pain pump put in her that was attached to her dura and it it worked for a while then it just went horribly wrong but that's a longer story but at the time we were trying to figure out do we make this decision and our pastor looked at us and says there's no sin involved in this decision you've done your due diligence you've sat down and talked about this with the professionals your doctor and so forth there's no sin involved in this there's this is not a moral equation here we're within the confines of Scripture. We're not violating any of God's precepts. And I would suggest the same applies across the board for all of us as caregivers when we're making decisions as long as we understand the parameters of what God says. And we use that to guide us in our decision making. Being good stewards of money, being kind and considerate, thoughtful, committing it to prayer. All of these things involved as you make this decision that you may have to make unilaterally for the betterment of the unit, understand this. You may be making that decision, but if you are standing on the principles of God's word, you're not making that decision in a vacuum. You're not leaning on your own understanding. You will acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will direct your paths. Now, the question is for us as caregivers, do we believe that or not? Is that something that is going to be anchored in our soul or not? And I ask you, my fellow caregivers, would you be willing to do that with your decision making? When we do that, that is hope for the caregiver, that conviction that we can live a calmer, healthier, and dare I say it, a more joyful life, even while serving as a caregiver, even while making hard decisions, okay? We'll talk about that some more, but sometimes we have to make the decisions unilaterally on what's best for the unit. This is Peter Rosenberger. This is Hope for the Caregiver. We'll be right back. Peter Rosenberger. He's Irish on his mother's side. <laughs> 